Hi, my name is Timothy Johnson, and I am preaching a sermon titled, God Can Handle Your Mess, from the text Hebrews 9, uh, no, from, from text Hebrews 4, chapter 4, 9 through 16. The verse reads, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also enters, also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active and sharper uh, than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even, even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the Son of God, let us hope firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace, grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I know that was a long scripture and that was a lot to, that was a lot to digest, but I wanted to get every part of that scripture um, in there because I think uh, both parts are important. I think the main focus of that scripture, the main part that people focus on is the bottom half when it gets into Jesus the high priest. So it's talking about... Um, Jesus, the the God who can, who know, who sympathizes with our weaknesses, and um, who sits on the throne of grace, and we can go to Him confidently. But I think the passages before that are equally as important and really set up what Jesus being the high priest means. And so I think one of the biggest things struggling people are dealing with in church today is uh, definitely emotional health. Uh, obviously, this is Suicide Prevention Week, um, and you see a lot of pastors and a lot of places doing messages on depression and things of that nature. But if you look at whether it's depression, anger, anxiety, addictions, whatever else like that, what is like one of the roots of those things? And I think it's a form of legalism that um, people kind of are addressing, but not a whole lot. It's not a legalism in the sense of getting onto people for messing up or not being perfect and that kind of deal. I think it's self, I think it's actual self-regulation. I think people are trying so hard to put on this mask or this thing that they're perfect because they're afraid of how people will view them, that they're keeping all of these negative feelings and negative thoughts inside and it's literally killing them. It's eating them from the inside out. And then in times of struggle or stress, it just erupts. And they're the in and that you know can that can come out as an emotional overreaction. It can come out as depression. It can come out as anger. It or people shield it with some type of addiction or something like that. Or then it comes out as pride or whatever else like that. So I don't actually think that pride, depression, anger. I don't think those are the underlying issues. I think they are symptoms of emotions and memories and things that are like twisting up inside of us that we're not releasing. And the thing is, God wants us to release that. We were never meant to carry all that. God wants us to be in a place of rest. And in order to be in that place of rest, it means that we have to be vulnerable. So that's why the first two parts of that are so important. So you say, hey, this is God who's created this place of Sabbath rest for you. And Sabbath rest is, and, and the reason why the word, why Sabbath rest is important is it's not talking about a rest of, oh, just resting from your works. It means resting from striving. It means that you're not fighting for love. You're not fighting for attention. You're not fighting for grace. You understand that the love of God is a free gift and that's been given to you and you're loved and that you're, accept, you're accepted and there's affection being given to you simply because you are a child of God. You don't have to fight for any of that. And you don't have to disguise yourself um, to try to keep God from not taking it away because God is not a man and that he goes up and down with the times. He is the same way yesterday, today, and forever. 
But then I think the second part of that is like is really, really important because even though it begins off talking about the word, I love the way the um, the, the passage the, pa the the passage finishes it finishes in twelve and thirteen is it says nothing is hidden before God. So we have this God who sees everything. He he sees he sees everything anyway. You're pretty much you're basically naked and up uh, to use strong language before him. He can see everything anyway. And he's like, There's no need for you to hide all that stuff from me. I can take it. So, you know, many people may ask, okay, so why can I trust God with my mess? You know, this is some some people may some people may have a distrust of people. They may have a distrust of um of others because they've been hurt before, they've been failed by people, they've been failed by the church, which is totally understandable. And the same thing with God, if you have, if you, the based off the view of God you've been given, if you've seen God as a tyrant or as a, um, or as a misogynist or whatever else, like there's so many different views of God that are put out there, not, not necessarily the real him, you may have conflicting issues of why you should trust God. And so let me give you just a few reasons of that. Number one, as said in verse 13, he knows you better than you know yourself. He formed you. He created you. He literally put the hairs in your hand and he knows them by name. He created He created a path for you. He's created a purpose for your life. He's given, he's, he, he's developed every part of you inside and out, mind, body, and spirit. And he also, being 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 omniscient, he knew that you would have problems. As a matter of fact, he made you imperfect so that you would need him. He wants you to be. He wants you to grow more and more dependent upon him. And why would you have to depend on someone if you didn't have any problems? So therefore, he knows you. He knows. What, he knows that you can have issues. He's like, just tell me anyway. And so it's like, well, you know, people are like, well, you know, the Lord knows my heart and the Lord knows this. Yeah, but you still need to release it. You still need to let it out. The other thing is, and I think what's really cool about verse 14 is it talks about um, that he's that he that he that he that he's a high priest, that Jesus was a high priest that um, that that sympathizes with our weaknesses. I think it's a huge it's, it's, so some translations use the word sympathize some translations use the word empathize. I prefer the word sympathize. And here's 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 the difference. Empathy is this thing where um, you can you can look at someone's situation and you say, "Man, that really stunk." I don't know what you're going through, but that really stunk. So, for instance, um, say someone's struggling with uh, a disability. I've never been disabled. So I can't say, man, I know what you're going through because it's, it's not true. But I do know what is, but I, but I do feel their pain, and I, and I don't, and I hate the fact that it's able. So I empathize with them. Sympathy is completely different. Sympathy is when you, you've been through what someone is going through, and you understand it, and so therefore you can connect on, connect with them on a personal level. So for instance, I have a mother with multiple sclerosis, and so it. It doesn't allow it doesn't allow us to be very close because she just can't remember much. So therefore, when I meet other people whose parents have multiple sclerosis or debilitating diseases, I connect with them on a personal level. Why? Because there's sympathy. I I am going through what they are currently going through, and I think that's what's so cool about Jesus. He was human. He didn't just become human just to show us how to live. He became human so that he could experience everything that we went through go through it, conquer it, and then say, hey, that thing that you're dealing with that you think that is just impossible to overcome, hey, I overcame it. Hey, I overcame it. Take heart. I have overcome the world. You can trust me. You can come to me, and we can overcome this thing together. So the pure fact that Jesus is human makes him the perfect high priest, the perfect person to go to and talk to about it because he went through it, he experienced it, he conquered it, and now he wants to counsel you through it. And so I think, so as people like, you know, okay, hey, this is great. I like, I understand that I should trust God, but how do I, be, but hey, vulnerability and honesty, it's not really that easy for me. I totally get it. For most guys and even girls, it's, it's not, it's not very easy for you. We're, we've become used to hiding our secrets and used to not telling people things. But 
it's a process that we have to we have to walk through and God is very patient. So I think number one, um, we have to practice the art of solitude. This is not just a simple thing of getting away from people. I think getting away from devices, getting away from um, TV and phones and even music. I think I'm not saying that worship music is bad, but even getting away from that because with worship music, this one thing about his thing, funny thing about worship music. When you listen to certain music, you're trying to you're trying to use that music to essentially put a bandaid over the thing that you're feeling. When God wants you to actually experience the thing that you're feeling and then tell it to Him so that you can deal with it. So getting in a place of solitude where you're completely cut off from everything allows feelings and thoughts and things to come up and turn and come out and there's nothing you can use to try to get rid of it or make or stimulate or to make it go away and so therefore it's just you and God to have to deal with it. I think solitude is an incredible tool. I think you need to talk to trusted friends and companions. Hey, we're not supposed to do life alone and James talks about the power of confession and so really confessing stuff and I don't mean like, oh man, you know, I just, you know, I had this thing, but I'm good now. I mean, like, hey, when you're in the middle of it, just saying, hey, this is how I really feel. It didn't always have to be sin issues. You just to be like, hey, this is how I feel. Talk to people about it so that they can walk with you through it. You're not supposed to do life alone. And then lastly, build deeper roots with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your friend and companion, and he's your helper here on the earth. And as you build deeper roots with him, he'll point out things to you, and you guys can walk, and you guys can walk and grow together. And as your relationship with Christ is going, you'll be a lot more aware of what's going on in your inner world, and that'll make you, uh, that'll that'll allow you to deal a lot more with what's going on in here, and it'll make you a lot more comfortable with sharing your mess with God. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this message. Um, Thanks and have a great one.